Hi, this is Anthony Gualtieri from NYU Langone Orthopedics, and we will be presenting a case of perineus longus tendon transfer, the remedy of a patient with drop foot secondary to complete anterior compartment musculature loss. The patient is a 17-year-old, otherwise healthy male who had developed a severe right lower leg infection requiring debridement of essentially his entire anterior compartment musculature, leaving him with a functional drop foot. 16 months after his final surgical procedure and debridement and complete resolution of his infection, he was indicated for a gracilis free flap and tendon transfer procedure in an attempt to restore his ability to dorsiflex. Upon examination, the patient could not actively dorsiflex his right foot or extend his great toe. He could passively achieve 20 degrees of dorsiflexion. His perineus longus, brevis, and posterior tibialis tendons were intact. The patient did have voluntary firing of a small portion of his tibialis anterior, proximally in his lower leg. Preoperative MRI demonstrated extensive post-surgical changes with almost complete absence of all structures in the anterior compartment of the lower leg. Conservative management for drop foot mostly focuses on physical therapy to regain dorsiflexion function and supplemental ankle foot orthoses to keep the foot in neutral position. Surgical treatment for drop foot is mostly published upon in post-traumatic cases of common perineal nerve injury, in which the perineal tendons are affected as well as the tibialis anterior and extensor hallucis longus. In these cases, posterior tibialis tendon transfer is most often utilized to restore dorsiflexion. However, in cases of functioning perineal tendons, as in this patient, the perineus longus may be utilized for transfer instead. This preserves the posterior tibialis tendon, a major tendon stabilizer of the arch of the foot. The occurrence of flat foot after harvesting the posterior tibial tendon for drop foot, in which both the anterior and lateral compartments of the legs are paralyzed, as in common perineal nerve palsy, is rare. And this may be because in the palsied foot, loss of perineus brevis function as a result of nerve injury and loss of posterior tibialis tendon function as a result of tendon transfer result in a new dynamic balance preventing the arch breakdown. In contrast, in the presence of normal function of the superficial perineal nerve, the perineus brevis muscle, the primary everter of the foot, is unopposed after the posterior tibial tendon transfer leading to a higher possibility of development of flat foot because the deforming force exerted by the perineus brevis is a well-recognized feature in the development of adult acquired flat foot. This leads to hind foot valgus and midfoot collapsed caused by insufficiency of the posterior tibialis tendon. Perineus longus transfer for restoring dorsiflexion has the advantage of leaving the posterior tibialis tendon intact on the medial side and the perineus brevis tendon intact on the lateral side to balance it. Additionally, if the perineus longus rather than the posterior tibialis tendon is utilized, in cases where the patient later develops paralysis of the perineals, the tibialis posterior may still be used as a later point as a salvage for tendon transfer. Cohen and Cabral reported 57 cases of drop foot caused by leprosy or Hansen's disease in patients with an average age of 39 years. Among these patients, 19 cases were considered to have a selected paralysis of the anterior compartment of the leg with functioning perineal tendons. These patients were indicated for perineus longus tendon transfer. The post-operative results showed that average dorsiflexion was 10 degrees and plantar flexion was 32 degrees. 
Fifteen cases were very satisfied with the procedure, being able to walk without any kind of supportive brace. Two cases were satisfied with the result, but still wore a brace for walking long distances. The authors also reported two cases with poor results, with weak dorsiflexion after the transfer. The authors attributed these poor results to possibly poor patient selection for the procedure because of undetected weakness of the perineal tendons. The patient was positioned supine on the operating table and a thigh tourniquet was inflated. The entire length of his previous incision was utilized. Local flaps were elevated circumferentially around the scar to elevate the cutaneous tissue. The space that was formerly the anterior compartment was opened up. Branches of the perineal nerve were discovered laterally. This was explored proximally toward the proximal tibialis anterior remnant muscle and fibular head. Branches of the perineal nerve were noted coming into this region. The perineal nerves and the anterior tibial vessels were localized, dissected longitudinally, and freed circumferentially, including the nerve and vessels. Attention was then turned to the distal stumps of the residual extensor tendons. These were identified through a longitudinal midline incision just proximal to the ankle joint. The extensor tendons were noted to be extensively scarred together, essentially forming a sort of extensor wad. Plastic surgery then proceeded with harvesting and preparing the gracilis for free muscle flap transfer. Once this was performed, the gracilis was left in situ and the external fixator was applied. Two half pins were inserted in the tibia as well as in the first metatarsal with a transfixing pin through the calcaneus. A pin to bar apparatus was created and locked in place. The foot was positioned in the external fixator in approximately 5 to 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. Then a lateral approach was made distally. The perineus longus tendon was identified and transected as distally as possible. It was then brought into the wound in the mid to distal portion of the leg. It was transferred in an appropriately tensioned manner side to side to the lateral aspect of the aforementioned extensor tendons. These diagrams depict simplified lateral and AP views of the foot and ankle. On the lateral view, one can appreciate just how distally the point at which the perineus longus tendon was transected to afford maximal length for the transferred tendon. On the AP view, the recipient site for the tendon transfer is depicted. It was at the level just proximal to the superior extensor retinaculum. The flap was then harvested, brought down to the lower leg region. A 5 mm suture anchor was brought and placed into the anterior tibia approximately at the desired level of the insertion of the muscle itself. We then sutured this and weaved it into the muscle proximally and tied it down with the large sutures that were placed with the bone suture anchor itself, and then weaved it to the rest of the muscle in the area consistent with the previous tibialis anterior. Operating microscope was brought in, vessels and nerves were cleaned, neurolysis was performed, and tissues that were healthy and viable were all identified. The muscle was then brought down. We had positioned sutures at 5 centimeter increments to be able to pull this back out to length with the leg slightly abducted. We did this and then tightened a little bit more, and then took a pulver taft weaving into the remaining tibialis anterior tendon weaving it in multiple passes, allowing for appropriate tightening and appropriate interpositioning with the foot in good position and the tendons in good position. We sutured this together after the pulver taft weave of the tendon was completed, holding it in place and holding it in position. With this, excellent positioning and orientation of the flap was achieved. It stimulated well upon testing and the activity was excellent with the foot in appropriate position. The external fixator was removed one month after surgery. The patient was then transferred to a cam boot at all times. He was kept non-weight bearing for a total of two months. Four months from surgery, the patient was allowed to begin walking without the cam boot, 
although he was instructed to keep the cam boot at night. Four months out from surgery, the patient is doing well. There is visible contraction of the proximal muscles of his anterior compartment. There are palpable contractions of his gracilis and perineal muscles. He has grade 2 to 3 toe and ankle dorsiflexion. His gait is improved, although he still ambulates with a mild steppage gait. He feels he is walking better than before. Thank you for watching this video.